My first client was a young single mother from Kailicha, the large informal settlement on the outskirts of Cape Town. That morning, at 4am, she got up and made breakfast for her children so they would have something to eat when they awoke. Then she walked to the taxi rank, queued, and spent the next four hours getting to town. She was spending the last of her savings to visit the small business centre where I was consulting, not so much to see me as to see anyone who could help her. She made school clothes for people in her community, sewing by hand from fabric they provided. Despite sales, she wasn't getting by. This was almost 20 years ago. I was 24 and had graduated with a degree in engineering only months before that. I was poor for a member of the middle class. This young woman was simply poor. In that moment, her sitting where you are now, me here, I felt utterly helpless. My education didn't matter. Whatever I knew about business strategy, about marketing or SWOT analysis or anything, paled before the naked request for immediate help so that she could feed her children tomorrow. Maybe you are in a similar position. Maybe you have come online searching for someone who may have advice for you which helps you today and for all the days that follow. I'm Gavin and these are the Coffee Conspiracies. I will do my best to ensure each episode has at least one practical thing you can use to improve or safeguard your business. My guidance will be kept deliberately simple and I will tackle only one topic at a time. There are three things critical to the success of any business. Good information, good design, and good luck. Given advantages of education, family wealth, social connections, or simply living in a prosperous community, it is far easier to create a successful business. But not everyone is so fortunate, and neither can anyone guarantee luck. Most business advice, and certainly most of what you'll find online, whether it be focused on branding, marketing, taxation, or even regulatory compliance, all form part of ensuring successful business design. But they are all premised on the notion that a business has the potential to be profitable at all. Without good quality information, that can only ever be a blind assumption. There is almost nothing you can do for a business if it fundamentally has no potential to make a profit. If the revenue potential is greater than the break-even point, all is well. Which leads to the very first question you should ask yourself, whether it is about a new opportunity or about your existing business. Can it work at all? Market sizes are finite. Hyperside, there are only so many paying customers and they only have so much money. Similarly, expenses are fixed. And if it is to survive, your business always eats first. This has real practical implications. Getting information to answer that question is time consuming. Although if you know what to look for, it is available. Ordinarily, I'd use Pikaya, a software system my company developed to demonstrate by example. The database behind it contains the approximate rent, staff numbers and costs and market opportunity of every commercial property in England and Wales. Pikaya gets its data from various statistical sources and these are aggregated into one place. Here you can see a restaurant in Bath with estimates on costs and revenue. And here's the Zoopla listing for that property showing rental of about £480 per square metre. Maybe you're not interested in Bath, or maybe you don't even live in the UK, but you can find similar statistics for the town where you live. For this episode, I'm going to take you through an exercise you can do via the internet or even on the back of an envelope. The process works no matter your industry, but given the name of this series, I'm often going to pick something to do with coffee. For any business, two numbers are in continual conflict. The first is your cost of being in business. The second is what the market can support in terms of sales. However you arrive at those sales, whether it be individuals buying cups of coffee or cafes buying bags of roasted beans or roasters paying for maintenance on their equipment, you cannot sell more stuff than there is market to buy it. You only want to know a few numbers. First, what is the average rental per square meter for the class of property you're interested in? You can usually get this from an estate agent. Second, how many people will you need to employ and what is their average pay? With those two numbers, we can estimate an average break-even. The sum of these is typically about 20 to 40% of break-even. I'm always conservative in my estimates, so divide the sum of rent plus wages by 0.2 to get that break-even. You can see how this works out here. On the left are typical values for the UK for retail space. Retail, especially cafe retail, tends to be extremely pricey in comparison to office or industrial space, which is why the rent is so high relative to what you'll pay in salaries. 
You've also got everything from food and input costs, shrinkage, tax and business rates, staff uniforms, training, breakages, all to come out of your revenue. 8% is fairly typical as a profit margin overall. Note that's not your markup. A cup of coffee might cost £1 to produce. You're not selling at £1.8. Profit is what you earn after all expenses. Margin is what you charge over the base production cost for each item. Efficiency is what you're aspiring to achieve as a ratio of wages to revenue. For each pound you spend in wages, you want to earn back six pounds in revenue, and that's just to break even. We can work forward to what that looks like from a sales perspective. If you sell coffees for two pounds fifty each, that translates to 9,650 cups per day, and you only make a profit when you sell the 9,651st cup, even though you're making one pounds fifty margin on each. Which is why you should try not to only sell coffee. Selling sandwiches for £4 and coffee for £3 will reduce your number of sales to 3400 per day. So now you know what you have to do to break even, and it may look intimidating. What it doesn't tell us is whether it is at all possible. We need more data. Third, what is the total floor area for all similar businesses in the area where you want to run or already do run your business? You can find that out by asking your local authority or your municipal council. Fourth, what is the total market size for all these businesses? And that's in cash terms. Again, your local authority should know. But Gavin, I hear you ask, why are you working on total market size? I'm only interested in one business, mine. Good question. Other businesses can be good or bad. They can be better or worse than you will be. But the overall market size is relatively static. At the end of each month, whether your clients are people, other businesses, or even government agencies, there is no loose change. Very few people end the month with lots of unspent cash. I can guarantee you, no matter how spectacular or innovative your product, the market for it is already being met. Money, time, headspace are all already occupied with other people's products. To get in there, you'll need to elbow space and take a little from what other people are earning. Sure, markets grow, but usually only with population size or, if you have them, tourist numbers. To grow faster than a market means taking more from others' existing clients. That isn't as easy as you think, so we need some concept of what that market looks like, what impact you're going to have based on the site you'll rent and how much market room you have to play with. The healthier the better. Lots of competition isn't a bad thing. It makes it easy to explain what it is you're doing. I call that the milk problem. Is your product as easy to explain as milk or is it as complex as quantum physics? The easier to understand, the faster to market. By looking at the whole market, we get an idea of how healthy that market is. Once we have numbers for total revenue and total floor area, we divide to get a revenue per square meter. Then we multiply that by the floor area of your cafe. That gives you the other number. The difference between this revenue number and your break even gives you a rough approximation of the margin of safety, of whether there is a market of sufficient size to support your investment. That doesn't mean it's a good investment for you though. That comes down to what you can afford to invest and taking a risk on close to on 800,000 pounds a year may be too much for you. In the next episode of Coffee Conspiracies, I'll be looking at financing and setting your expectations. Oh, and the young single mother. My first client. Her clients were other parents at the nearby schools, people as poor as herself. She was offering them credit since they could not afford to pay in one go. That left her without any money for anyone for herself, and no money to do more work either. In poor communities, a great deal of lending happens informally. These credit cooperatives, much more sophisticated versions of crowdfunding services like Kickstarter, are found all over the world. In South Africa they are called Khoi Khoi or Stockfels. Just about every poor person is a member. It is the only way to survive irregular employment. I encouraged her to work directly with her Stockfell and those of her clients. Instead of her lending money, let the Stockfells do the job for which they were designed. That way she gets paid right away and the person buying the clothes continues to get the credit they need. It's not a long-term solution to poverty, but it was the solution that young woman needed for that day. Until next time, let's go find some coffee.